pure, primitive devotion. Pure, that is, free of anything that contaminates, anything that doesn't belong. Primitive, not in the modern sense of undeveloped, but rather ancient, original, and devotion, that is, dedication and adoration and worship of the Lord God. Tonight, we consider the strange yet scriptural worship of the New England Puritans. Well, let's reflect before we do a little bit about their audience. A lot of people read about, hear about the Pilgrims and the Puritans, and we all represent something of a cross-section. First of all, we consider these are the ones who left house and home back in their country of England to go into the wilderness, an errand into the wilderness, and they claimed that it was because mainly they wanted to worship God according to the Word of God and their conscience as informed by the Word. These who uh, left England, many of them going to Holland as the pilgrims, but not find that, finding that to be a place where they could uh, ultimately land, they went to the New World, to the Americas. First, the pilgrims in 16, or the P pilgrims uh, in 1621, and especially in 1630 and onward, the New England Puritans. Uh, very, very similar in many ways. Here's an image from Plymouth Plantation, which I'm sure. Uh, many of you have gone to visit. How are these pilgrims and Puritans viewed uh, by these different uh, um, segments of American uh, society? Well, in popular culture, there can be something of a, of a romance, an idealism of these people. Uh, they, for some, have been in American society something larger than life. The ones who... who were so brave and courageous to come to this dangerous, hostile environment? Well, all of uh, America has been influenced by these people, and uh, many of us, if not all of us, celebrate Thanksgiving remembering the first uh, uh, Thanksgiving that is uh, said to have been celebrated by the pilgrims and the Indians, and we see it even in popular culture, don't we? In a, in a hundred different ways, sometimes uh, in rather amusing ways. Well, within broader society, there's also those who don't look at them so very favorably, whom I'm calling the secularists. Whether academic or your rank and file, none, N-O-N-E. They would view the pilgrims as narrow-minded, bigoted people who uh, exiled this great hero, Roger Williams, to Rhode Island because uh, he wouldn't conform to the absolutism of the powers that be in Boston. Uh, they would rally behind a, a woman such as Anne Hutchinson who had the, the, the tenacity, so they say, to challenge the Puritan establishment and so to be uh, one of the early free thinkers. And of course, uh, these people, uh, they'll speak very terribly of the Puritans, and it's not so very hard when you look at these Salem witch trials, and we're not going to suggest that everything the pilgrims and Puritans ever said or did was honoring to God. Who could we ever say that of except Jesus Christ? But the black eye that the Salem witch trials has given the Puritans is enough for many who don't believe in God to say, there's nothing that we need to be concerned about with these people other than to dismiss them and tell people, don't be like them. These are the bad guys. Then there are historic Presbyterians. Now, keep in mind that the Scottish and English Presbyterians were really almost like fraternal twins with the English Puritans. 
Uh, in fact, here we have an image of the Westminster Assembly, which met in the 1640s, uh, mainly by Presbyterians, but there were other Congregationalists as well. And uh, interestingly, three of the New England Puritans, uh, John Cotton of Boston, Thomas Shepard of Cambridge, just outside of Boston, and John Davenport of New Haven were actually officially invited to sit on the Westminster Assembly, but there's that little thing about the Atlantic Ocean. And in those days, that wasn't such an easy proposition. So there's going to be an awful lot of similarity and sympathy with historic Presbyterians, although there may be some, but some would say lesser details of church polity. Uh, there's been a, a renaissance of, of uh, a certain kind of Calvinism, new Calvinism. These are the more conservative of modern evangelicals. Uh, they might have a greater consciousness of the fact that they are heirs of these great Calvinistic uh, forefathers who really believed in the sovereignty of God, really believed in divine providence. And then broader evangelicals, really anyone who's ever learned about the, the pilgrims uh, can have some a sense of, of identification with them. Uh, some may be a bit more educated, but many somewhat ignorant about uh, anything more than just that first Thanksgiving and Squanto and things such as that. Uh, ignorant about what these people really believed. There are forefathers but how very much like them are we? Well, in particular, as we look at their worship, and their worship for some is uh, enough uh, to, to write them off, uh, but they in general and their worship in particular were, uh, for, for some, for many, old, odd, and offensive. Now remember, the reason they came over was because they were offended. They were offended that they could not worship God in their own country according to the Bible and that they were having uh, ceremonies foisted upon them that they did not see from the Bible and which they were mandated to observe in church. And so Samuel Danforth, he's a, a second generation Puritan. About 1670, he reminds his listeners he said, why did you come here? You came for the enjoyment of the pure worship of God according to his institution without human mixtures and impositions. To what purpose then came we into the wilderness? And what expectation drew us hither or here? Was it not the expectation of the pure and faithful dispensation or administration of the gospel and kingdom of God. We're willing to sacrifice greatly in order to go into a waste howling wilderness that is hostile in order to worship God purely. That's why they came over the Atlantic and why they started from scratch. The colony of uh, New Plymouth or Plymouth in 1671, this would be the second or third generation, they memorialized that original motive of their pilgrim fathers in Plymouth uh, that they came uh, with the liberty of a good conscience to enjoy the pure scriptural worship of God without the mixture of human inventions and impositions and that their children after them might walk in the holy ways of the Lord. Well, what were some of the distinguishing features of their worship that they considered so important? There was psalmody, psalm singing. Uh, they didn't sing any other songs of human composition, but what they believed was that God clearly taught that the psalms should be sung and that uh, to that end, they put it in English meter and in rhyme and they sang the psalms in church. This is an image of the very first book. We mentioned this earlier. You may have read it before, and 
It's uh, slipped your mind, but uh, this happens to have been the very first book ever printed in America, the Bay Psalm Book, the Massachusetts Bay Psalm Book. Richard Mather was uh, one of the, the translators. Here's an image of Psalm 1 singing of the, the man who is blessed, who meditates upon God's law day and night. Here's a, a selection of Psalm 100. All people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice. Him serve with fear, his praise forth tell. Come ye before him and rejoice. That's what they would have been singing in 1640. Now, they weren't the first. They followed uh, those who went before them uh, during the first generation of the Protestant Reformation. Now, Lutheran churches, of course, there was the composition of hymns, great hymns. A mighty fortress is our God. But countries that embraced the Calvinistic or the Reformed position, such as the Netherlands and Swiss, parts of Switzerland, including Geneva, France, France was filled with Protestants who sang the Psalms, and sadly, they were butchered by the Roman Catholic Church. The Church of England was uh, at least halfway reformed, and they sang the Psalms, and Scotland, of course, the, the hotbed of Presbyterianism. Here's an image of uh, one of the, um, the editions of the French Psalms. You'll notice they're translated by Theodore Beza. He was the successor of John Calvin. Uh, Cotton Mather of Boston, the third generation of Mathers, uh, he wrote in his classic, The Great Works of Christ in America, the following words. Reader, when the Reformation in France began, Clement Moreau and Theodore Beza turned the Psalms into French meter, and Louis Guadimiel set melodious tunes unto them. The singing hereof charmed the souls of court and city, town and country. They were sung in the Louvre itself, as well as in the Protestant churches. Ladies, nobles, princes, yea, King Henry himself sang them. This one thing mightily contributed unto the downfall of popery. That's an old word for Roman Catholicism. And the progress of the gospel. Further down... Behold the Reformation pursued in the churches of New England by the Psalms in a new meter. God grant the Reformation may never be lost while the Psalms are sung in our churches. What was this old, uh, odd, and even off-putting worship that they engaged in? Well, their praise was a cappella. It was unaccompanied. Now, that may seem strange, for, uh, for us to think about those who were so very concerned about being biblical, after all, didn't God ordain in the Old Testament that all kinds of instruments were to be used in the worship of God? Psalm 150, for example, various instruments are appointed for the worship of God. Well, the Pilgrim and Puritan forefathers were not unaware of these things, but they had thought through many of these issues. And they asked this question, this is the Cambridge Synod of 1648. A synod was basically a large church council of all kinds of pastors and elders from the churches of Connecticut and Massachusetts. They came together to answer certain questions. One was this, whether instrumental music may lawfully be introduced into the worship of God in the churches of the New Testament, considered and answered. The instrumental music used in the old church of Israel was an institution of God. It was the commandment of the Lord by the prophets. Now, there is not one word of institution in the New Testament for instrumental music in the worship of God. And because the holy God rejects all he does not command in worship, he now therefore in effect says unto us, I will not hear the melody of thy organs. Again, strange probably to many of us. 
But this was their position. This was their understanding from God's Word. And they said the church history, interestingly, bears this out. Instrumental music and the worship of God is, they claimed, but a very late invention and corruption in the church of the New Testament. The writings that go under the name of Justin Martyr, that's one of the uh, early apostolic fathers, uh, these writings deny it and decry it. Chrysostom speaks meanly of it. Even Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas himself, uh, the great poster child for Roman Catholicism, about 400 years ago determines against it as Jewish and carnal. Well, this doesn't prove anything. We're just simply going over the historical material. But we might uh, just observe that they did allow some percussion instruments, and I'm sure every once in a while they just may have had a blast. I had to. I'm a father. Sabbath keeping. Uh, the Puritans and the pilgrims very much believed in the abiding relevance of the fourth commandment. Uh, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. They believed that six days were meant for work. The seventh day has from the foundation of the world been instituted as God's holy day of worship. The whole day is to be dedicated to the public and private exercises of God's worship. It's not a day for doing our own pleasure. No, it's a day for the Lord, and especially a day for us to gather together. And so it was the common practice. This was the high point of the week for the pilgrims and the Puritans. I joyed when to the house of God go up, they said to me. Jerusalem within thy gates, our feet shall standing be. And they didn't have any problem with two services on a Lord's Day. Sadly, so many of us can do with just one or even less. No man-made holy days. The Puritans were against any holy days that didn't have the express precedent or commandment of Holy Scripture, no matter how much they may have been prized or valued, handed down from their forefathers. In 1659, they, they actually, the general court of Massachusetts, forbade the practice of Christmas for several years. Now, that was eventually uh, revoked, but it certainly does give us something of an index about how strongly they felt about this. A little milder uh, uh, approach, but nevertheless one just as principled might be uh, held forth by William Bradford. He was the governor of uh, Plymouth, and he writes in his history of Plymouth Plantation this very interesting and amusing anecdote. Herewith I shall end this year. Only I shall remember one passage more, rather of mirth than of weight. Uh, on the day called Christmas Day, the governor uh, called them out to work, as it was used, but the most of this new company, these were the newcomers, excused themselves and said it went against their consciences to work on that day. So, the governor told them that if they made it a matter of conscience, he would spare them until they were better informed. So, he led away the rest and left them. But when they came home at noon from their work, he found them in the street at play, openly, some pitching the bar and some at stool ball and such like sports. So he went to them and took away their implements and told them that was against his conscience that they should play and others work. If they made the keeping of it a matter of devotion, let them keep their houses. But there should be no gaming or reveling in the streets, since which time nothing has been attempted that way, at least openly." The principle that the Puritans uh, adhered to in this respect was if God ordains the time, such as the Sabbath day, if God ordains the time, if under the Old Testament He ordains a Passover, He ordains a Feast of Booths, then we are to observe it. And we're to make no changes unless the Lord Himself makes a change. 
Question, whether it be in the power of men to state or appoint any days of public worship, no time is to be made holy to the Lord, but what is made holy by the Lord. Now, they did not exactly um, have everyone applauding them. This uh, amusing book here is written really to, we might say in the modern day, roast the Puritans uh, for their their austerity and their their narrow-mindedness. This is the examination and trial of old Father Christmas, together with the clearing by the jury. So uh, Father Christmas, at least in this book, uh, gets off and uh, the Puritans are uh, duly scolded. But uh, it's generally understood, this is not not, uh, something that's some kind of great secret, Uh, that this was, in fact, the universal practice of of the first two generations of those who lived in New England. Uh, Christmas was unknown, practically speaking, until the mid-1800s. This article here, uh, written by a a lady by the name of Rachel Schnepper in the New York Times, uh, writes that they contended that there was no scriptural warrant for the celebration of Jesus' birth. Puritans Puritans argued, and she says, not incorrectly, that Christmas represented nothing more than a thin Christian veneer slapped on a pagan celebration. Believing in the holiday was superstitious at best, heretical at worst. She continues... As the Massachusetts minister Increase Mather explained in 1687, Christmas was observed on December 25th not because, quote, Christ was born in that month, but because the heathens' Saturnalia was at that time kept in Rome, and they were willing to have those pagan holidays metamorphosed into Christian ones. Now, before we really get into the biblical rationale of our forefathers on some of these points that to us may seem so very odd and far-reaching. Let's address some common myths and mistakes, or at least be aware of some prejudices that we all, in one way or another, come with when we're looking at these men and women of old. Whether or not we say it, or maybe we hear it from others, the Puritans hated life. That's the idea. Is it possible to have fun for the Puritan? One word, no. That's a word that as little children we like to say a lot and apparently according to some that was the Puritan's favorite word, no. The Puritans were the bad guys. They didn't like to have fun and they didn't like others to have fun either, which is why H.L. Mencken once said, Puritanism, by definition, the haunting fear that someone somewhere may be happy. There were Scrooges. That's what they were. Well, we don't have time to respond to everything, but there's an awful lot of mistake I would point you to this very, very helpful scholarly book, Worldly Saints, the Puritans as they really were, and I think you'll get quite a very interesting um, second look at these people who were much more human and much more down to earth than some would suggest. The Puritans were legalists. They were always forbidding No Christmas, no Easter, no instruments, no laughter, no dancing, and so on down the line. Now, I'm not going to suggest, again, that everything that the Puritans said was wrong is necessarily wrong. We've got to be intelligent Christians reading our Bibles, and sometimes there can be overreach. Aren't we guilty of that at one time or another? Garrison Keeler put it this way, my ancestors were Puritans from England. They arrived here in 1648 in the hope of finding greater restrictions than were permissible under English law at that time. Is that really the case? 
Or is it more fair to say that notwithstanding any extremes or eccentricities or warts or wrinkles that they may have had, that these were God-fearing Christians that loved God and loved his law and thought, you know what? It's good that we have fences. If they're God's fences, they're not meant for our unhappiness, but rather our happiness. The law is good, says the Apostle Paul. I will walk at liberty, says David, for I seek thy precepts. That's freedom. And I think there's a lot more of that to the reality of the early pilgrims and Puritans than some would make out. The Puritans were intolerant. Here's Roger, Roger Williams, who has recently been booted from the the, uh, heavy-handed Massachusetts fathers to brave his way through the winter into Rhode Island. But again, there's just much more to the picture. I'll give you one little snippet. This is also from Cotton Mather now. He's the third generation, but listen to how he speaks of Roger Williams. He doesn't suggest that Roger Williams wasn't problematic. In fact, I would dare say that he thought, yep, he kind of had what was coming to him. But listen here, it was more than 40 years after his, Roger Williams, exile that he lived here and in many things acquitted himself so laudably or praiseworthy that many judicious persons judged him to have had the root of the matter in him. That is, he's a sincere Christian during the long winter of this retirement. He used many commendable endeavors to Christianize the Indians in his neighborhood, of whose language, tempers, and manners he printed a little relation with observations wherein he spiritualizes the curiosities with two and thirty chapters whereof he entertains his reader. This doesn't sound, this doesn't sound like at least across the board, the Puritan fathers were just hard-hearted, calloused men. And I think if you read the history about Williams, you'll find that there was a fair amount of problems with Mr. Williams. The Puritans imposed their culture on others. Well, is that exactly true? Did they all put guns to the heads of the natives, make them dress in Western clothing? Or did they have a certain respect and even a desire to evangelize them. Not all of them, for sure, but many of them. This was the seal of the Massachusetts Bay Company coming out of that little little, uh, banner uh, from the mouth of this native, come over and help us. John Eliot, not Jim Eliot, often confused, but John Eliot, the first great American missionary right here in Massachusetts. He went to these people, he learned their language, and people were converted and they developed what was called a praying villages, one of them, Natick, Massachusetts, several of them, these praying towns uh, that he established. He translated the Bible into this language that he took the pains to learn. He didn't put a gun to the head and say, learn English. How many of us might cross our arms and say, you need to learn our language first. That's not how John Eliot looked at it. These people are made in the image of God and they are perishing. It wasn't so much to impose some kind of Western culture as it was to bring the good news of the gospel And so he also, because they were psalm singers, he translated the psalms into their native language. This is in the back of the John Eliot Bible, the metrical psalms. Here's Psalm 23, the Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. Well, the worship of the Puritans in the wilderness, why? Well, very simply, God is God. God is God. You've got to start there. You'll never understand any of these uh, practices and traditions that you may think so very strange unless you start with this basic principle. 
In the beginning, God. The heavens declare the glory of God. He is the mighty God, the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. He is the eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. These were people who were uh, centered on God. God was everything to them. Thomas Hooker, the founder of Connecticut, the farewell sermon that he gave in England, he appeals, he appeals to, to those in England and to his own people, uh, uh, pleading with them, we must cling to God. He is everything. We must so be so extremely concerned that we are not displeasing him in any way. The presence of God is everything. But he asks, what is the presence of God? Answer, in one word, it is the particular favor of God expressed in his ordinances and all the good and sweet or sweetness that followeth there. The purity of God's word and worship is that which God reveals himself in. And it's when you begin to feel the force of that that you begin to understand why they were so concerned to go to God's book and say, if we're going to meet with God in the house of God, if God is coming there, if his presence is being manifested, we want to make sure that we're not bringing all the things that we like, but doing those things that please him and will keep him here with us and with our children. Because if he is not here with us, it doesn't matter how successful we are in the new world. We are Ichabod. The glory is gone. Not only is God God, but God has spoken clearly. He spoke at Mount Sinai to the children of Israel. As we read Exodus 20, those words came from the top of Mount Sinai by the Lord himself. And then God wrote them upon two tablets of stone, boys and girls, with his own finger. Clearly, no ambiguity. He commissioned Moses to write all these words so that they would not be lost. So the very particularity, the jot and tittle, would not pass away. This is our life. We must hold on. God continued to speak by the prophets. Scripture grew and developed, and he preserved it unto the New Testament and the present day, so that now at the end of the world, when Jesus Christ has come, he sends forth his servants, and they are his messengers to speak authoritatively in the name of God according to his word. It's hard to understand the pilgrims and the Puritans today in our extremely relativized postmodern world, but if God is God, and he is, and if he has spoken clearly, and he has, then that changes everything, doesn't it? Now, God governs all of life. God calls us to love him with all the heart, with all the soul, with all the strength, with all the mind. And it's not just the Sabbath day in which he wants to be glorified, it's the other six as well, just in a different gear. Whatsoever you do, whether you eat or drink, says the Apostle Paul, do all to the glory of God. Or as was penned in the shorter catechism of that Westminster Assembly, what is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And so they came over the waters of the Atlantic, not just to have the Sabbath like they wanted it, not just to observe the pure ordinances of religion on the Lord's Day. It was so that they would be free to serve God seven days a week. 
But here is where they are very unique. And that is when it comes to worship, the formal act of worship, there is a different rule. It is not, as in all of life, whatever God has not forbidden is permitted, but it's the opposite. Whatever God has not uh, commanded is forbidden. Going back to the uh, Westminster Assembly, which uh, produced the document, the Westminster Confession of Faith, the light of nature shows that there is a God who has lordship and sovereignty over all, is good and does good unto all, and is therefore to be feared, loved, praised, called upon, trusted in and served with all the heart and with all the soul and with all the might. But the acceptable way of worshiping the true God is instituted by himself and so limited to his own revealed will that he may not be worshiped according to the imaginations and devices of men or the suggestions of Satan under any visible representation or any other way not prescribed in the Holy Scripture. Now, is that biblical? Our forefathers thought so. They pointed to the final words of Deuteronomy 12, in which God says, when you go into that land, don't. Don't do as these heathen do. Thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God, for every abomination to the Lord which he hateth have they done unto their gods. Going down. What thing soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. The principle, they said, continues into the New Testament. Matthew 15, our Lord quotes from Isaiah. In vain do you worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Paul to the Colossians. If you are dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why are you subject to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, which are all to perish with the using? These things have indeed a show or appearance of wisdom in will worship and in humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Will worship is not God's will in worship, but here it's my will. I will. I will worship God in this way. I will worship God on my terms. That's not the way of the Lord. And so the Cambridge Synod said that the sacred scriptures pronounced it an argument sufficient for the rejecting and condemning of anything in the worship of God if God himself has not prescribed it. Thus, Jeremiah 7.31, they did that which I commanded them not, neither came it into my heart. You see, I didn't command them this. Increase matter. Hence, God would not trust his own faithful Moses to put a nail or a pin in his tabernacle without his precise order. How then can we think that he has now left a door open to every fond conceit of men that may get uppermost in the church? He has enjoined us what rights he saw fit in the New Testament and limited us to a rule. But how is it a rule or a boundary if going beyond it is no transgression? But, says Christ, Mather continues, ye transgress God's command by your tradition. Then he asks, did they, that is the Jews, repeal or contradict it? No, but they went beyond and added to it. Proud man will not be kept within bounds. Our plain worship seems too rude and bold. Ceremonies are thought to beautify it. But, says Christ, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Finally, God's honor is at stake. 
The authority of our Lord Jesus Christ as the glorious King and prophet of His church is profanely invaded when the worship of God with the significant ceremonies of it is taught by the inventions of men. Increase Mather says that the Lord is infinitely wise and good. It's comely and modest for us to rest in His institutions, few and plain. Our additions cannot make them better. What then are they good for? Do not we see how this meddling wisdom has deformed all in the papacy, that is the Church of Rome? Earthly kings are tender of their prerogatives, and shall not the Most High God? Now, we close with some reflection. First of all, for those who would identify with these fathers, evangelicals of different stripes, Let's listen to our fathers. O God, we with our ears have heard, our fathers have us told. What works thou in their days hadst done even in the days of old. We owe it to them. At the very least, the fifth commandment, honor thy father and thy mother. Now, that doesn't mean that father and mother are always right but they do deserve our attention. And especially, these are some of the godliest Christians, I dare say, who have ever walked upon the face of the world. If you doubt that, you need to read more of and about these Puritan fathers. Furthermore, consider, is Christianity the product strictly of heaven or is it the product of men, or something in between? And so, the baptism of John, was it from heaven or of men? What is our faith? What is our religion? Is it in any way a concoction of men? What communion has light with darkness? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? Is this what our religion is? Is it a mixture, a pick and choose, a combination? I'll take some of this, but hold that. And what are we saying to the world? If at the end of the day, when they start digging, they find that a sizable part of our faith is the production of men. Well, there has been a renaissance of interest in Reformed thinking the Puritans and pilgrims being reformed. And consequently, there's been a, a, a changing of worship, often going back to that which is older and more reverent, and we're all for reverence, and the Puritans would have been all for reverence. But the Puritans uh, would challenge and saying, all right, but is 18th century good enough. Or we look at uh, some particular practice that seems to, uh, seems to be identified with an earlier and a godlier day. Let's bring that into church. Uh, people are doing Lent. They've been doing that for generations. It seems well motivated. Let's, let's do that. And it becomes, again, a free-for-all. It's a movement away from the trite and the empty. But has God ordained this? Some of the great uh, compositions of, of praise from the history of the church no doubt mean many things to us. But the question is, has the Lord instituted it? Has He ordained it? And where do we draw the lines? I've heard some people, even some friends of mine who who would say, you know, those last two hymns, those are the good old hymns, but this one, this one is just a little too, no, I, I don't think that's right. And so I believe in the regulative principle and Christ alone can't, can't come in. Well, is it really arbitrary then? Why do we say the piano is okay, but not the guitar? Or why do we say the guitar is okay, but not the drums? Increase Mather again, allowing men to devise and impose some religious ceremonies, we see not where to stop. 
Some say ours are but few and easy, no more than three, but who bid the imposers stop at three? Have they not power to add three more? And so on, and so on. And if you draw a line, are you so sure that it's God's line or just your arbitrary taste? And where does it stop? And let's not forget that Rome wasn't built in a day. Last, I want to say a word, no doubt to no one here, but maybe somebody listening now or listening at a later point who may approach the Puritans in a kind of academic way, but with no sympathy whatsoever. These are the bad guys, right? These are the ones that we can't run fast enough away from, right? We're so much more advanced, right? We've got our act together. We know what is wisdom. We are more developed, or are we? We are healthier. Or are we? We have family defined and integrated well, much better than these earlier people. We know what family is and we're able to carry it on successfully. Or are we with our divorce rates, with the fragmentation of the family? We're happier. Certainly we have to be happier than those old starchy Puritans, or are we? We understand ourselves, or do we? Much more so than these people who didn't understand that they were captives to their own medieval views and were not in bondage to anyone. We don't take marching orders from anyone, or or do we? What about our children? Are our children happier than the children of the Puritans? You can't imagine. I remember one time a friend of mine once learning that one of the other neighbor kids, he was Jehovah's Witness, and they didn't observe Christmas. And I remember his friend saying in my presence, If I didn't observe Christmas, I think I'd kill myself. People can't even imagine being happy without it. And yet, are we really happy? And are our children happy? I would dare say that our children are not happy. And our children are increasingly confused, not knowing which end is up. And none of this proves that the Puritans were right about anything, but I would suggest that they are worthy of our greater attention, worthy that we should go back to them, especially as these people, they knew God, and they knew His book, and they may have gotten certain things wrong, and that's for you to decide between you and the Lord but they certainly were happy people. And I think we would be happy if we absorbed Psalm 1 like they sought to absorb it and to sing it. That man hath perfect blessedness who walketh not astray in counsel of ungodly men nor stands in sinner's way.